Yeah. Okay, so let's let's start. Uh, and again, the first presentation is fintech and of experts, uh, and the second presentation is a more technical topic. Uh, but I will try to be a little bit technical as well. And uh, my name is Dmitry Zaitsev, and I has been working at the experts portal for three days now. Three days. Three days. And, uh, but <laughs> actually, that's uh, a little bit longer story, and that's my name once again, and it, it's being misspelled a lot. Uh, I joined the experts in 2006 as a head of the mobile development, and we had been doing some pretty cool stuff for seven years uh, when I decided to move on. And uh, now, since 2014, I'm acting as uh, account and senior project manager in our company. Um, uh, and the company I tend to love a lot, as you could see, uh, is on the market of the software development services for, since 2002. And uh, millions of people use our products daily, and multiple times they received, uh, not, not the people, but the products received uh, industry awards, and they are all a collective results of more than 300 uh, engineers working in our company. That's our headcount, excluding administrative, financial, HR, other department, that's just technical headcount. Uh, and our team is uh, distributed globally. Uh, we are represented in Europe, US, Middle East, and Asia. And we gradually keep our expansion well, according to the business strategy and uh, following the market needs. And so what is this market more precisely? What is FinTech? What do we do? From the very beginning, the experts had a laser sharp focus on uh, capital uh, market trading software, and which is a part of the much broader FinTech landscape. And as the name suggests, FinTech means technologies for finance, and there are many, many different flavors of, of them. And over the year, in addition to the capital market, which again is just a fancy term for all kinds of software that helps you trade different kind of assets. Uh, we also incorporated into our experience exchanges, uh, insurance, wealth management, and uh, crypto trading projects. Still, that's quite a narrow focus for the company, a software company of our size. And this allows us to gain in-depth understanding and uh, not of just technologies we do, but also uh, market challenges, trends, and uh, competition for our customers, faced by our customers. And this helps us not only provide them technology and development services, but also consulting on top of that, because we know on what market they operate. And we prefer to engage into uh, long-term relationships and the majority of our customers stay with us for three, five years or longer. And the longest relationship we still have at the moment actually started around the time the company was founded in 2002. And now let's move on to, to the craft work we do. And the goal for this presentation for me is to let you see and get a perspective of uh, how fintech software is similar and different from other kinds of software uh, on the market. And let's start with similarities. Um, even if we speak of the software uh, in general, it would be fair to say that the following attributes are important. First is the value it brings to the user. Uh, if it doesn't solve an important problem, it's just useless. Uh, so it should do it quickly, uh, and without excessive waiting time, at least. The data should be safe and uh, the software shouldn't fail on you without any particular reason. And even th when there is a reason to fail, it should do it gracefully, if possible. Uh, availability, what if you need to get access to a software but you cannot do it for any reason? Again, it becomes useless, even if it exists. Uh, and last but not the least, it should be a pleasure to interact with. We all love it elegant and efficient. And all this generally applies to all kinds of software. But again, I want to give you some good perspective on why the importance of this 
skyrockets in fintech software and more, sh more precisely in the capital markets trading software. But before we dive into these further details, raise your hand, hand who thinks that he's good at math. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, not so many hands, even among the smartest people in the world. <laughs> No, no, you are, take, you, are, you are taking that too deeply, okay? <laughs> so, uh, what I want to say that is the sad truth is that people in general are pretty bad with numbers. When it comes to numbers, we used to do some subjective and intuitive decisions that appear to be false more often than we want them to be. And human intuition fails with these kind of Arabic numbers, even with dollar sign in front of it, but it also fails with any kind of numbers, actually. And, well, can you still say that you are good at math looking at this one? <laughs> okay. Okay, so pure human performance with numbers is pretty much the reason why people who are really good with them uh, are often portrayed uh, as weird, but at the same time granted with some kind of mental superpower. And we all want to have a superpower without being weird. <laughs> and uh, that's, in my opinion, is the key to understanding the value of the FinTech software, because it really helped us to deal with and acquire some kind of a superpower in dealing with uh, the most important numbers in our life, our income, our savings, our home payments, mortgage, and other stuff, and overall financial success. So. Now back to the checklist of the great software features. Uh, and we start with value proposition. And thanks to the FinTech, uh, a lot of people, us mere mortals, get access to the algorithms that really help us to get much better understanding of the financial reality surrounding us. And some of these algorithms, like Noble winning Black Scholes algorithm, it really changed the whole banking and trading industry. Uh, by simplifying access to financial tools, uh, FinTech helps to exclude some slow uh, traditional ins institutions from the equation where possible, or just make the, the supply chain shorter and cut on commissions, cut on cost of the financial services. Uh, thanks to that, businesses can focus more on their core activities not on accounting, not on their payments, loans, or similar, that are still important, but auxiliary. And it also helps us individuals to get access to much, much wider set of saving, investment, analytical tools. And a personal example of mine, just about a week ago, I managed to open the brokerage account with my bank by sending them a request from the mobile application confirming it with the code and push notification then sent to me, and the next day I started trading brokerage. That's the convenience we couldn't even imagine even a few years ago. And now it becomes mainstream. So moving to a little, little bit technical side, uh, cloud-based algorithms can make a decision to buy or sell an asset within milliseconds once the price hits some level. And if it's not executed instantaneously, uh, the market moves and you either not get the best price or you are not executed at all. Uh, therefore, it should be fast. Even when the trader made of flesh and bone is making the decision, uh, the software should still be fast because first of all, it should uh, compensate for our human slowness and should try to catch up. Uh, and the second is that uh, we all love our tools to be, to know that the tools we use are the best. And there are people who actually go and compare, quote, latency in different products and post their findings on, on the YouTube. Uh, and it's hugely popular videos some, uh, in some group of people who are interested in that. Uh, so proper analysis of the past is the way to build a strategy for future and the backtesting is uh, one of the most popular way to, uh, to build trading strategies. So the more data you have, the, the better will be a result of your 
testing of, of testing of your strategy, just like high resolution screen uh, will render a better picture. That's very good comparison here. Uh, and therefore, uh, yeah, so we store everything and we try to use this data. Uh, and uh, therefore, no wonder that performance QA uh, is not an option in many, many projects. It's a mandatory part of the development process there. And here is an example taken from our uh, DX feed market data provider, Everyday Life. They collect data from numerous exchanges and for ex execution parties and redistribute to individuals or businesses using subscription model. These 10, millions, 10 million messages per second are quotes, order book updates, historical data requests, and uh, many, many other uh, TIG data information. Uh, 500,000 transactions per second are, include executions on uh, exchanges on equities, futures, and options in across, uh, around the world, essentially. Two petabytes of data is the huge history of financial information collected from 1970s, and that's just a part of it, obviously. Uh, and it grows daily at the increasing speed. Every day, you get more data than it used to be yesterday. And sub-millisecond processing time is quite self-descriptive here, and it's really easy to do the math in this case. <laughs> and then comes the sensitive thing, the security, because people are ready to share their holiday tickets on the Instagram for some reason, but they would hate if you knew how much they paid for them. Uh, and uh, Security is important, but when it comes to money, people just get paranoid about securing their data. But people and businesses uh, would like to share, they need to share some of the information to increase their uh, value and, uh, well, or to just brag about themselves, uh, while still retaining full control over the process. So developers are bound to find some balance uh, between security and transparency and information circulation in a proper way. Most of the trading businesses are regulated. Regulators and compliance are there to make sure that you handle data properly. Uh, and what if you don't? If you don't, it's one of the easiest way to destroy your business reputation or kill the business completely. Uh, and that happens really, really fast. In, we saw that in many cases. Again, to achieve that, we employ uh, a range of tools that allow us to make our code safer and compliant with the best industry standards. And now, financial markets are quite unpredictable. Uh, there, are no, there, there are still holidays <laughs> when there is a silent period, but uh, there are unexpected shifts on the market uh, when, uh, that leads to avalanche of issued orders, increased number of quotes per second, and people rush to the platform to log in and try to save their money. Uh, and this is, these moments are very, very hard to predict. That's why it's unexpected market move. Uh, so such events create uh, some kind of a chain reaction, and uh, the load may momentarily increase tens or hundred times compared to the normal usage uh, load on the platform. Uh, there are also events that happen on schedule, and result in the same, but not that drastic increased uh, load on the platform, but they still should be handled gracefully, and uh, there's, that's the whole playground for, uh, for the architecture pattern, code optimization, and testing approaches aimed towards the goal uh, that are incorporated in our development process. So, now the platform is functional, it's secure and it can handle load gracefully and properly. What else may possibly go wrong? Uh, and every minute of the downtime during the market open hours will definitely lead to complaints, with, but it will also lead to lost profit or just direct losses on the trader's side. So it just cannot be a part of your regular maintenance and uh, operations that you do any kind of interruption in trading during the trading hours. Uh, the tricky thing is some markets are traded around the clock, like crypto, they are traded always. And uh, 
Therefore, it creates uh, the great place and playground for high availability architecture, on the fly software updates, uh, rolling updates over the multiple nodes of the cluster configuration, and so on and so forth, to make it run like a clockwork. And another side of availability is even if the platform is up, but you cannot use it at the moment because you are not in front of your laptop, it again becomes useless for you. So uh, it should be, you should be able to have access to it. And therefore, you need to create a client application for all kinds of popular platforms that will allow the trader to do their job on the go, at home, or in the office, regardless of their circumstances. Uh, and I see that you are pretty bored already about all these uh, bullet lists. So, <laughs> and thank you very much for staying with me. Uh, and let's move to the user interfaces, some pretty pictures ahead. Let's start with what I already mentioned before when talking about overall platform solution performance. Namely, that's abundance of information that you need to show on, on the screen. And people trust their money to the platform and uh, any available piece of information that will help them to make better investment decision is important for them. Therefore, you cannot hide it or make it unavailable for them. To illustrate it even more vivid colors, that's the actual real money manager layout on, on the four screen monitor uh, workstation. And the goal for it, for just building that kind of workstation and creating that layout. It's quite simple. The more data you have at a glance, the better you can trade. And that's what they do all the time. Uh, but can you try to hide some of this information for a cleaner look, for better uh, usability? Unfortunately, as a vendor, as the creator of the software, you, you cannot do that. You cannot deprive user from the information. But um, ideally, you should provide a tool set for them to be able to manage this and decide for themselves when they need and what they need at what point of time. And with obviously with some reasonable defaults implemented out of the box so that they can start right away without configuring it for hours. And it's not just a lot of data. They are also updated quite frequently. And um, you need to find a balance between uh, visibility of these updates in your UI so that the user can see that something changed and the strobe like effect that will make it useless and will blind people sitting in front of the uh, in front of the screen and that's the work for designers and developers to make to find that balance uh, there are for sure on the market more professional and more uh, consumer type of products for trading and uh, on the capital market arena. But there is definitely no two kinds of people who are either professional or consumers or new newbies. Uh, They're all different and there is a whole continuum of users who are different in how professional they are, how uh, ex uh, experienced they are, how they look at the market, what assets they trade what data providers that they trust, and so on and so forth. And no wonder you cannot create just a single customer journey from start to end and polish it to perfection. Uh, instead, you, what, you create what we call an open world customer journey. Uh, when you can customize it to your, to your needs, to your style of trading, uh, and get the data you need, and uh, walk around in the way you like pretty much like in the modern computer games. Uh, but many service, services nowadays are built around uh, with a mobile-centric approach. And even those who have desktop and uh, web application as, as their main terminals, they started to regard mobiles not just as an auxiliary, but as an important channel to their users and traders for the reasons I, uh, I mentioned before. And therefore, the same way of thinking applies to the mobiles as well. Uh, 
Um, there are indeed limitations in screen size that are specific to mobile. And we found that uh, creating similarly flexible UI for tablets or smartphones doesn't really make sense. While it's possible, it doesn't improve the user experience that much. But at the same time, they want to have the same features. While the layout is simpler, they want to have all the data they would have access to on the desktop or web. And uh, you may ask, what about smartphones? And you've guessed it, they come along and there is a lot of data that you have to give the, uh, to the user on, even on the smartphone. And from our experience uh, with some of our customers, more than one third of all trades happen just on the iPhones, not counting Android, tab tablets, and so on. And that's a major brokerage uh, firm. So, yeah, you need to include mobile platform. That, that's the bottom line of all this. Uh, another interesting is example of the customizability and uh, what, you, what your product should be able to do uh, and the interface should be capable of is, is this. Imagine that you took your critically acclaimed platform uh, to the business trip to a Japanese company in Tokyo and while they seem to be happy about the features they see, they don't seem to like the UI. And in discussion, you find that they do not like colors in particular. Uh, and the reason for that, that we think that green is good and red is bad. And therefore, we mark uh, increasing values or positive values with green, negative values with red. But for in Japan, that's different. They think that red is good color. And bad color is, you can guess it, it's blue. <laughs> and that's just one of nuances uh, that can be easily spotted right away and fixed quite easily. Uh, but there are many, many uh, uh, more others that are harder to find, harder to fix, uh, but they still can be annoying to the users. And the bottom line, to target international markets, uh, the product team should know the, all these specific and your product should be capable of adjusting to them. And other products that we develop, um, sometimes not focused on, on the trading, on the active trading that much, but more are about analytics. And uh, they are not that densely filled with the data, but they still should be uh, beautiful. They should be easily accessible for the users, even non-professional users, uh, and they should be easy to use and attractive overall. So just quickly recap uh, all, all the stuff uh, I talked about. There is abundance of information that frequently updated. Uh, you create an open world customer journey requiring many, many tools in your UI uh, to allow it for the user to do. Uh, you have to include mobile platforms and implement applications for them. Your product should be internationalized and it should still be professional looking and beautiful. It's not the time of 20 years ago. Well, some people know what Bloomberg looked like. Uh, it doesn't work anymore for any new products. And just in case it went unnoticed, from time to time we get some rewards, not just for technology, but also design um, awards and prizes. And one of the products you saw on the previous screens uh, received Berlin Design Award just last year in FinTech category. And moving on, FinTech is quite controversial area and it's, it tends to combine uh, old school way of thinking and doing things with innovations at the same time. And some of the more recent UI technologies is what I wanted to talk about a little bit more. Uh, Technology-wise, chatbots may not seem like a rocket science, uh, but this is a huge step forward in user interaction and design. And if we combine them with natural language recognition, text-to-speech, uh, and make them work smoothly and seamlessly, it really starts to feel like magic happening. And it may not be the right way of doing things for all the use cases like actively trading, but for user onboarding and for user support, that's, that those, uh, those areas can greatly, greatly benefit from 
uh, neatly designed conversational UI. And much more interesting and at the same time less employed yet at the moment in real world application is the, are augmented and virtual reality applications. Uh, we are, DevExperts, uh, is a member of uh, and co-head of FinTech committee, uh, consisting of leading, uh, the, the leading association with more than 4,000 members, uh, organizations specializing in AR and VR uh, domain. We had a stage on multiple uh, conferences on this topic and maintain, keep maintaining in depth understanding of the area. Uh, believing that once technology advances enough, uh, this will become the base for the new generation of tools in fintech, but also in many, many other uh, areas. How do we do that technology-wise? Uh, historically, we are a Java house, and the vast majority of the backend code is written in Java. Uh, and high-performance desktop applications are also created in Java. And there was a recent shift towards electron-based desktop apps. Uh, and front-end technology will be the topic of the next presentation and the next speech. We'll love typed code and use TypeScript for that reason, uh, with some nice touches of the functional programming and libraries. Both Android and iOS are native applications we develop with some touches of embedded active web content. And .NET stack is, uh, is used for some customers who want uh, to have non-Java code uh, of their own. Hello. <laughs> Questions in the end, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, and our engineering forces are spread across Europe and two cities in Russia. Sofia and Porto are our most recent news location, opened just last year. Uh, speaking of, of the lifestyle and the benefits, uh, we have modern, well-equipped office here located in the center of Porto. Uh, you managed to get here, <laughs> at least. Uh, we have flexible working hour, possibility of the remote work. Uh, we have multicultural team. Three languages are spoken in this office daily. Uh, snacks and beverages in the office, food compensation, good health insurance program. Uh, well, team participate in conferences, uh, in drinking and uh, winning uh, competitions. <laughs> so that's it, and thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, it's time to ask me. But just before questions, we will have, uh, after the questions, we will have a five minute bio break and then the next presentation on algebraic data types. So do not disappear. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs>